welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome back if you're joining us uh, one more time from this Urban Clock and welcome if it's your first one. Very happy to have you again. As usual, uh, if you want to drop, uh, to say hello in the chat and drop us a little line to say where you're joining from, uh, that's always appreciated. If you are not speaking, I would ask you to mute yourself. Uh, then this talk is available in English, in Russian, and in Ukrainian. So unless you speak all three languages, I will ask you to click on the icon, uh, the globe icon that is at the bottom of your Zoom window and, uh, and make sure you tune into the right channel. I see there's a lot of people already. I'm, uh, I'm, very, um, I'm very thankful for you to be on time. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to our moderator, Kevin. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Darini. Um, good evening, good afternoon, and uh, good morning, everyone. Also a very war warm welcome from my side to today's Urban Talk on Twin Transition, How Cities Embrace Sustainable Digital Transformation. This is indeed a very relevant topic for cities around the globe, and I'm happy, as Darina already mentioned, to see so many of you connected and able to join uh, today. So my name is Kevin. I'm Urban uh, Innovation Specialist at the UNDP uh, Global Center for Technology, Innovation, and Sustainable Development in Singapore, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator today. And of course, a very warm welcome and a big thanks to all speakers for being with us today. Um, as I mentioned briefly, I'm working for the UNDP Global Center in Singapore. And before we kick off the topic, I just wanted to say a few sentences about the center and the work we're doing here. Um, the center is a joint initiative uh, between UNDP and the government of Singapore. And we're looking into how technology and innovation can be leveraged for sustainable development, drawing insights from around the world, but also from the thriving ecosystem here in Singapore, from public to private sector, academia, and many more. We're working in five main areas, um, sustainable development, uh, sorry, sustainable finance, uh, on climate and sustainability. We're looking into deep tech, so new cutting edge, uh, cutting edge technology for sustainable development. We're also working on digital inclusion, digital transformation, and how to tackle digital scams. And of course, the fifth area is smart cities and urbanization. In this work stream, we explore how people-centered technologies and innovation can drive sustainable development. Um, and instead of smart cities, we really advocate for smarter city. So cities where people are at the center of action. So this approach is based on a comprehensive analysis we have done of UNDP's global work in urban and digital with over 150 initiatives and projects uh, with in approximately 80 countries. One example of those projects is the City Experiment Fund, which is a partnership between UNDP and the Ministry of Finance of the Slovak Republic, which has been working with cities in the region on urban transformation and increasingly using technologies. And among others, they've also collaborated with the Almaty Development Center, which we have a representative here today on the panel. So why is it important to work with cities? I think I, I will just present a few numbers, but I'm pretty sure you have heard all of them. I mean, urbanization is happen happening at a rapid space. There are actually uh, worldwide 1.3 million people which are moving into cities every week. And despite that cities are only covering 2% of the planet's surface, cities generate more than 70% of greenhouse gases and consume two thirds of global energy. A recent UNDP ITU report has shown that 70% uh, of SDG targets all relevant in the urban context, benefit from the application of digital technologies. So technologies and digital transformation really present an opportunity to enhance city sustainability, livability, and resilience. And if done well, cities can be an important driver for sustainable development. So in the face of increasing pressures from climate change, but also the rapid technological advancements, cities are embracing the twin transition to really leverage the potential of technologies and achieve sustainability. But when we speak about the, trans the twin transition or digital transformation, or sometimes we also speak about the shift towards a net zero future, we speak about major changes which affect people. So it's really people which are at the origin of these transitions. They're the main implementer and also recipients of, of the result. So it's not it is important not to forget that. Here's, 
I hear some background noises. Okay. Um, so, so it's really important to keep in mind that people are at the center of these transition. And this is also why these transitions need to be just, making sure that no one is left behind, whether on the digital transformation side or moving towards more sustainability. And cities and municipalities, of course, being the, often the closest to people can play an important role in this endeavor and in this journey. So this is also why I'm very happy to have such a distinguished panel of experts with us today who can share with us their experiences, their insights on how cities can successfully embark on this journey and really leverage digital transformation for sustainability. So the agenda of today's webinar is structured as follows. So first, we're gonna talk about theory and then moving into practice with presentations from Birmingham in the UK, moving then over to Kazakhstan, more specifically to the cities of Almaty and Astana. This will be followed by a panel discussion and a Q&A session. And as Darini mentioned, you can use uh, the chat box to pose your question at any time. Uh, we will pick them up during the last segment of today's webinar. And with that and further ado, I'm very happy to introduce our first speakers from Birmingham. We have Dr. Zoya Purmirza. Uh, she's the, the, the academic director of Smart System and senior research fellow at the University of Birmingham. Her research expertise is energy system digitalization with a focus on ICT design, data communication, um, and cybersecurity. She has previously served as a policy advisor for the UK government, working on the cybersecurity framework for EV charge points. We also have Dr. Grant Wilson. Um, um, Grant leads the Energy Systems and Data Group at the University of Birmingham. And he's a former fellow of UK's National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. His research interest lies in the field of data for decarbonization and particularly around energy systems flexibility. And lastly, we have a surprise last minute speaker and we're very happy that he was able to join is Raj Mack. Raj has over 30 years of experience working in the public and private sector in diverse roles. For the last 19 years, he has been instrumental in developing Birmingham's digital and smart cities agendas, bringing together city partner collaborations between public, private, academic, voluntary and community sector organizations at the European, regional and local level to deliver school. digital transformation. Um, he was a driving force in positioning <laughs> Birmingham as a leading international digital city. And with that, I'm very happy to hand over to Zoya. Hello, everyone. Hello, good afternoon and good evening to some of you. Um, today, we are going to discuss um, the Atomic Project, which is about building a digital platform for the city of Birmingham. And we will start with some theories and then we will uh, talk about actual diatomic project and then we will share some of our learnings oh, wow. through this project. So I'm Zoya Purmirza and with me today is Dr. Grant Wilson and um, uh, Raj Mack from uh, Birmingham City Council. So can we go to the first slide, please? Yes, thank you. So. Um, in 2019, UK government committed to achieving net zero carbon emission by 2050, which we believe this will have a significant impact on our future urban development. So um, digit, we know that digitalization is considered as one of the core component of UK net zero journey. So what is a digitalization? Digitalization is the integration of various parts of our system with technologies such as IoT, um, AI, digital twin, and distributed ledger technologies. And I believe most of the people on this call would agree with me that digitalization plays a critical role in our future smart cities. For example, it can improve management, it can optimize resource utilization and supports decarbonization and decentralization of our energy system. So um, next slide, please. Yeah, so I just mentioned that uh, we consider digital twin as one of the main component of digitalization, but what a digital twin is and how it can help our cities. 
A digital twin is a digital representation of a physical asset or a process or a system. And as you can see in this picture, it has a dynamic connection to the physical twin and it has a bi-directional data. There is a bi-directional data flow between the physical space and the cyberspace. So digital twin have a number of applications across industries, for example, in aviation, in manufacturing, and of course, in smart cities, for example, to optimize urban planning, traffic management, and of course, enhance energy efficiency. But one key thing to remember is that not all the digital twins serve the same purpose. Um, they are different in terms of the frequency of the data collection. They are different in terms of data visualization or the fidelity of the data. And also sometimes um, in our digital twin, we may require real-time data sharing, but there are times that we don't need that and we, we may need less frequent data updates. So not all the, um, and also we know that not all the data in digital twin would come from the physical space. Sometimes there are other sources of data beyond the physical space. And next slide, please. Um, yeah, so now let's talk about the evolution of digital twin from digital model and digital shadow and, and um, how they differ from each other. On the left side, of this picture, you can see the digital model and digital shadow, and on the right, you can see the digital twin. So one of the main differences between this system is that the digital model rely on a manual integration of data, and they do not have automatic data exchange from, uh, between physical and cyberspace. But in digital shadow, we have automatic unidirectional information flow between physical and cyberspace, and in digital twin, we have bi-directional information flow between cyberspace and physical space. And we have integration of sensors from multiple sources of IoT, et cetera. And we have um, some remote monitoring and control added to our system. So we can see any changes in the physical space is reflected in the digital space. So now knowing that uh, uh, what is digital model, digital shadow, and digital twin, let's think where the diatomic project, which we are working on, falls. So in diatomic, we do have some static data. We do have some sensor data, which can be automatically integrated in our tool. But in our use case, the, our use case is around energy system. Um, an energy system is considered as, as one of the critical national infrastructures, we call them CNI. So we are not really allowed to play around these systems and we can't really have po positive loop and control over these systems. So basically our diatomic project uh, fits better with the definition of digital shadow. And next slide, please. Okay. Um, now talking about what a digital twin is and what are the benefits, we should be aware of some of the challenges digital twin po poses for us. So one of these challenges is around cybersecurity. The cybersecurity consideration for digital twin is twofold because we have we are working in a cyber physical space. So there is a cyber side, there is a physical side. The cyber side of the digital twin include, uh, uh, includes software, PC, cloud services, and the physical environment uh, includes a lot of sensors, actuator, and so on, and the communication uh, protocols between them. So we should uh, be aware that when talking about the cyber security of digital twin, we need to secure both the cyber side and the physical side. But currently, we don't have a security framework for energy system digital twin. But what we do have is a set of recommendation for these um, digital platforms, uh, which is accessible through the, this report, uh, where I can share the report with you after the call. So in this report, we, uh, we talked about the cybersecurity challenges. We also discussed the digital twin shadow and uh, digital shadow and digital twin have a number of 
additional cybersecurity challenges comparing to the digital model. And this is because of use of sensors and RAT system and also remote control functionalities that is available in digital twin. And next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so as we discussed in the previous slide, uh, there are a number of security challenges and issues associated to the digital twin, which needs to be addressed. Here we have four examples of the cybersecurity uh, attack that can happen in the digital twin. These are uh, reconnaissance, bad data injection, data delay attack, and model corruption. And next slide, please. Thank you. And among these um, these four attacks, let's say bad data injection is one of the most threatened attack um, in energy system because it can actually um, cause energy theft at the end user or device breakdown during um, operation of a power grid or power generation. So in this attack, the threat vector can inject malicious command or code uh, or unauthorized data into the cyber uh, physical system or um, into our device to deceive um, the system. So in terms of how this can happen, how this bad data injection can happen for the digital twin environment, as you can see on this picture, attackers can send false command to them. CPS cyber physical system to take control of the CPS and this command is not uh, actually this command is not a legitimate or correct command and it is not uh, initiated by the digital twin itself whereas it's it's been initiated by the attacker so um, these attack uh, attackers try to control the CPS and damage or destroy them. And um, having talked about cybersecurity challenges in DT, I should mention that in order to understand uh, the threat landscape, we should um, know our environment first. We should know where our devices and how our devices are operating. And we should know the specifics of the use cases and the architectures, and then apply some risk assessment to find vulnerabilities. And then according to those vulnerabilities, we can propose some strategies to harden these um, digital twins. Um, so uh, I would say that uh, no uh, one solution would work for all the digital twin and for all the use cases. So we need to be very specific. So now uh, we, we will move to the second part of the talk, which is about the digital twin project and our journey on developing this platform. And over to you, Grant. Thank you. Thank you, Zoya. Um, I'm just going to run through a pretty quick uh, overview of uh, the diatomic project itself and why and how that's been six su well successful in terms of some of our approach so far um just because of time I'm not going to run through all of the detail on this but it is uh, a joint project between Birmingham City Council and three universities within uh, the city the overall city of Birmingham each of those universities has a particular use case which it is looking at uh, to incorporate within the overall digital twin framework. Um, what that means is in terms of the approach that we've used, um, sorry, another slide effectively um, that Raj might uh, help to talk to at, at a future time uh, later on. There's an awful lot of interest in terms of Birmingham City Council itself in terms of the uh, ability of digitalization to help to deliver improved services uh, for people within uh, Birmingham City itself. Before we get to that, though, um, I did ask uh, whether or not I might be able to put a meme uh, together, and it was said that the audience would be appreciative of this. So I'm going to do this because I thought it is very, very sort of helpful in terms of providing a couple of serious points. So. There is a lot of interest in digital twins, effectively, at this, at this point. So there is a sense that, you know, what do we want? We want a digital twin. And when do we want it? Well, we want it now because it's important that we have it. But then we get on to, well, why do we want a digital twin? 
And that is a little bit more uncertain as to why we want one. But it is an important point that digital twins are attracting an increased interest. I think there's no question about that. But the use cases of digital twins are evolving. And I think that's also important to perhaps we'll look back to that to say it is an element of you just need to get started perhaps from time to time. Get started with one thing, do it well, and then try to expand from that rather than there is uh, perhaps a, um, a barrier in terms of trying to think that a digital twin is going to do too much, perhaps. And that is a, a reason for being worried about starting down a particular pathway. So I do think that's a very, very good um, sort of overview as to where things are at the moment. Initially lessons from the diatomic project uh, many cities will already have digitized systems and models um, and they're having to be considered a term without having to be considered a digital twin um, an exercise simply focusing on the barriers and problems of improving data you know and data on interoperability importantly as well could flag issues that can be um, you know would just help anyway without having to sort of put everything under a, a sort of digital twin umbrella um, it does take sustained resources to curate uh, good data. And that is our finding uh, again and again in terms of if you if you want good data, you need to put resources into having good data. And sometimes, you know, with capsule projects, I'm sure this is the same across the world. There's uh, an element of money funding that goes in initially up front, but then the running costs of whatever it is. Um, are perhaps less uh, obvious at the at, at this at the first and initial stage. Um, I think it's also important to do prioritize some effort into understanding the use cases that might be of greatest benefit um, initially to why one would want to think about a digital twin and what digitization might help with. What are the cost benefits of these? Because if you can focus on the things that do have some demonstrable benefit, maybe the easy wins. For, uh, for a better phrase, then that might help to continue to build momentum around this. Looking through the hype of digital twin approaches though, and there is a bit of hype around it, I think it's fair to say, um, it can still be very useful to have an overall concept to bring things together, you know, bring different departments together um, and areas of responsibility, just even an excuse to do things differently. So having a digital twin, as an overall concept to bring people together, that's fine. Um, not everything in tech turns out as a, a killer app um, or as expected. So, you know, I think it is important to use things like the UN and other places, other cities around the world is to, you know, dip into case studies, see what might have worked better or worse for them. I think at this stage, it is quite interesting that it should be sort of open and honest about some of the successes but also some of the maybe things that are not quite as successful as people felt they might be initially. Um, I am just going to sort of speed up. Um, this will be uh, available and shared online, but a couple of the main points here was due to the different use cases of the partners and diatomic project, uh, and also influenced by our, our sort of academic outlook on things, we had a bunch of principles that we arrived at, and that should, you know, it was, it should be as, flexible as possible uh, to allow things to happen in parallel, things to get developed in parallel. And that meant we used a, a microservices uh, approach um, rather than a monolithic single sort of architecture for the for this, which allows that sort of flexibility. We try and use open source frameworks as much as possible. Um, try and use commodity uh, cloud platforms as much as possible. And we also try and leverage infrastructure as software as much as possible. Um, all of this is to try and basically say, uh, try not to get locked in to any sort of single provider or providers, and also provide that sort of element of trying to keep costs down. So we think those are quite interesting aspects. Um, I'll just run over this very, very quickly. It's, it promotes an API driven approach to the sharing of data, try and get manual steps out of the process as much as possible. So we spend a, quite a bit of time trying to do that. Um, in terms of approaches on microservices, being flexible, um, it has some advantages in terms of prioritizing where to start uh, because it is flexible. Perhaps you don't need to worry so much of where you start because you can bring things on 
line uh, as you go along. So perhaps it helps with that getting started issue as well. Um, we At the University of Birmingham, we were looking at energy systems. We prioritized where to start from the availability of particular data sets and data sources that were we knew were available. So that's how we approached that. Um, just very quickly, this is uh, where we're going to with this. Uh, this is West Midlands Combined Authority. There's 320,000 sort of polygon data sets here where if you can zoom in um, and then you can click on buildings effectively that will pull up uh, different appropriate uh, things to do with that building. And eventually what we're trying to do is layer on 3D photorealistic tiles on that. Uh, Birmingham has these from Google. I checked, unfortunately, Astana does not. Uh, but if you can use it, then um, it might be useful to try and consider that. I'll stop there and just allow a little bit of time uh, for Raj uh, to uh, say uh, a few things about this slide. Thank you, Grant, and hello, everybody. My name's Raj Mack. I'm the Head of Digital City and Innovation for Birmingham City Council. And I thought it'd be just useful to provide some context in terms of what we're trying to do in Birmingham and why we're trying to do it. Our aim in Birmingham is to really try to use digital technologies to support economic growth, accelerate digital investment within to the city and ensure that our businesses and citizens benefit from it. We're trying to ensure that Birmingham has a test bed, a place for experimentation, a playground, if you wish, to, to enable new businesses, new applications and new innovations to take place in a safe environment, but really pushing and really accelerating that digital investment capabilities. We are trying to transform our services like many other cities across the world. We are seeing the impact of digitization. Many of our services are transforming and we're looking to how digital technologies can transform those. And certainly innovation is playing a significant role in doing that. And ultimately, we want to position and get recognition for our city as a leading digital city across the world. And there are a number of things that we're doing to actually support that. And the Diatomic project that uh, Grant has spoken about is one of the projects we're doing to try and really push the boundaries of what we can do with technology. But overall, we have a number of properties. As a city, our role is to really create those foundational activities, the, the foundations and the fundamental things, that are the, the building blocks that a city needs to have in place for others to innovate. And, and that's what we are trying to do with our program. So what we've done is to ensure that we have a good governance and leadership across the city, which brings together a number of organizations and stakeholders and partners from the corporate sector, from the voluntary sector, from the universities that are coming together to ensure there is inclusivity, to ensure that we are addressing city challenges and making sure the technology has a purpose rather than technology for technology's sake. We're also building the infrastructure. So we've been working with our partners to ensure that we have full fiber across the city, 5G accelerated and creating a data environment to enable us to share. And we're using that. We've already created a, a data platform. We've created a city observatory, which brings together a platform that enables um, data from multiple sources, different partners, different organizations to come together to be developed, exploited and create new applications from it, as well as give us some of the insights we need. And we are working with the community to develop innovation and digital inclusion projects to make sure that everybody is part of the city and not being excluded. And clearly, we recognize the importance of digital technologies in addressing the challenges of climate change. So there are a number of different projects that we are doing across this arena. The Digital Twins is one of them. And as a city, we are perhaps the consumers of this new technology. And as our developments grow and the investment in cities grow, we believe that the digital twin capabilities will help us de-risk, but also attract additional investment taking place in the city. Thank you. Well, Thank you very much to Zoya, Grant and Raj for this uh, presentation and for sharing really um, some theor theoretical approaches of digital um, of digital twins and then really apply it into a real life context. There's a few things uh, I, I could mention, but which really is <laughs> something which really spoke to me was was the meme um, that sometimes we ask for technology and 
we actually don't know why we want it. So I think that is a very important point, especially when moving forward, there's a hype around many things. Uh, and sometimes we actually don't know uh, what we want exactly. And the other things, two other things I noted down, um, I mean, the importance of cybersecurity, it's becoming an increasing issue. And I think especially uh, at the city level, uh, because very often cybersecurity especially frameworks and policies are more governed at the national level. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy be between um, national and local uh, governance in terms of, of cybersecurity policies. Um, so maybe something also to look into. And of course, um, the importance of data, having clean data, having reliable data, and then also how to actually gather this data. And maybe I'm pretty sure there's going to be a few questions around that uh, in the end. Uh, but let's move uh, forward uh, to our second uh, presentation. Um, so I'm very happy to introduce Andrei Shovkoplias. Um, he graduated from the Kazakhstan State Academy of Management with a degree in international economics. And he also has an MBA from the Massachusetts Institute for Technology. Um, in addition, he also he has a professional certificate in the field of sustainability. Um, Andrei has extensive background in the, in the, in the field of finance and oil industry, strategic planning, analysis, and consulting. And he was uh, over 20 years in senior positions. Um, based on a resolution from the board of directors from February 22, Andre uh, takes the, the position of the chairman of the board of the Almaty Development Center. And he will speak about digital innovations for urban sustainability. Andre, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, since I seem to be the only one wearing a tie, I will turn off my camera so not to get embarrassed. Uh, but uh, I'm truly honored to welcome uh, today to welcome you today as we embark on a journey through the strategic and transformative initiatives of Almaty City, as we align our city's ambitions with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We're not only envisioning a brighter future, but actually shaping it. This presentation marks a pivotal moment in our city's history, the beginning of a comprehensive plan that aims to redefine urban living by 2025 and set forth a vision that will carry us into 2030. I'd like to start by providing an overview of our city's current socioeconomic landscape, which sets the stage for the ambitious goals we have set to achieve. Uh, to address the accumulated challenges and advance the sustainable development of the city, the Almaty City Development Program was formulated in 2022, setting up objectives and outlining specific programs and projects up to 2025, with midterm prospects stretching to 2030. This strategic document, document was jointly developed by the city's administration and the organization I have the privilege to lead, the Almaty City Development Center. This program is a comprehensive blueprint designed to address urban challenges through innovative solutions and strategic planning, ensuring that every initiative contributes to achieving the SDGs. The City Development Program has seven main directions of actions which are closely related to each other. I will dwell on the main points that are important within the framework of the question posed, how we create a smart and sustainable city. Each de de developmental goal within our program is intricately linked to specific sustainable development goals. This integration ensures that our local actions not only advance Almaty's urban landscape, but also contribute meaningfully to global sustainability efforts. This alignment is vividly showcased in the voluntary local review which highlights how each facet of the program not only addresses local challenges, but also contributes to the global sustainability agenda. Each of the seven strategic directions, ranging from enhancing urban livability to fostering economic growth and ensuring environmental sustainability, mirrors the objectives set forth by SDGs. This alignment reaffirms our commitment to a sustainable urban future through its important to note though it's important to note the exception of SDG 17. Uh, importantly, we have published the voluntary local review on the United Nations website, and you can access it using QR code provided here. 
The 2023 voluntary local review offers a transparent and insightful look into how Almaty is advancing towards the sustainable development goals. It serves as an essential tool for adaptive management and engaging stakeholders, providing a thorough assessment of our achievements and pinpointing areas that require further attention. This review is not just a collection of data, it narrates the story of our institutional efforts that are crucial for realizing the SDGs. Additionally, on page 37 of the report, you will find a dedicated section discussing the advancement of Almaty as a smart city, detailing the strategic actions and innovations we have implemented to enhance urban intelligence and sustainability. Also, speaking about the Almaty Development Center, it's important to highlight that our organization has been recognized as a key contributor to the sustainable socioeconomic development of Almaty. We have strategically designed our own development program, which places significant emphasis on advanced analytics and digital solutions. Central to our strategy is the establishment of a think tank and the situational center. This entity is focused on enhancing the efficiency of management decisions through data-driven approaches and developing digital services tailored for both the mayor's office and the city residents. We are increasingly relying on machine learning and mathematical modeling to enhance our data analytics capabilities. These efforts are aimed at formulating practical recommendations that improve decision-making processes, ensuring that our urban management strategies are not only proactive, but also predictive, adapting to the dynamic needs of Almaty's development. Let me demonstrate how a few examples, now a few examples based on the Situation Center, the cornerstone in Almaty's development as a smart and resilient city. The Situation Center harnesses data analytics to optimize urban functions and enhances and enhance the city adaptability in the face of changing urban dynamics. For example, we can actively monitor the dynamics and accessibility of our public transport systems. This continuous data collection provides us with insights necessary to offer targeted recommendations for improvements and actively adapt recommendations to enhance connectivity and ensure the resilience of Almaty's transport network to meet both current and future demands of the city's residents. By uh, building analytical capacity, we're trying to improve decision-making capabilities based on data analysis for the strategic location of new social facilities. By leveraging data-driven insights, we ensure that essential healthcare and educational facilities are within walking distance for most residents, significantly improving accessibility and quality of life. The strategic deployment exemplifies our approach to building a resilient infrastructure that supports sustainable urban living and long-term community well-being. We are enhancing our analytical capabilities to strategically position new social facilities. By utilizing data effectively, we ensure that essential health and education services are conveniently located within working distance for most residents. This not only boosts accessibility, but also enriches the quality of life. Such thoughtful placement of facilities demonstrates our commitment to fostering sustainable urban growth and ensuring the long-term well-being of our community. In our pursuit of making Almaty a safe city, the Situation Center plays a critical role. It integrates and analyzes data from various sources to maintain high standards of public safety and preparedness. Our comprehensive emergency response systems bolstered by continuous monitoring, ensure that we are always ready to respond effectively to any crisis, demonstrating our city's resilience in maintaining security and safety for all its inhabitants. Advanced security analytics helps us effectively manage emergencies. With real-time data at our fingerprints, we can, uh, fingertips, we can quickly make decisions that enhance our response capabilities. This system helps not only in immediate crisis management, but also in planning and forecasting possible future emergencies, ensuring that Almaty remains a resilient and safe urban space. Thank you for your attention. I hope this uh, presentation has provided useful information on Almaty development towards becoming a more sustainable, resilient, and smart city. We are open to cooperation with all stakeholders. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, Andre, for, for your presentation. And it's always fascinating to see what you can do with with data and data-driven policymaking in a city when you're gathering all the data, connecting the dots, and then actually transform them in, in a livable experience for, for citizen. Um, and also congratulations for doing the voluntary local review. It's always uh, a big exercise, um, but it's very useful also for other cities who can follow that example and basically see how, how they're doing on their journey to, to achieve the sustainable development goals. Um, moving to our next speaker and the next uh, city in Kazakhstan, uh, I'm happy to introduce you to Amansol Yesekov. Um, he's currently uh, a project associate on digitalization and innovation at UNDP Kazakhstan. So with over a decade of experience, he has held various leadership roles, including deputy head of department of digitalization at the office of the mayor of Astana city. And in these roles, he managed um, significant budget, secured investment, and spearheaded innovative digital solutions. He has a strong background in uh, automating government services, enhancing information security, and driving digital transformation initiatives. Um, Amanzol, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Hello, everyone. As I said, Kevin, I am previously work at uh, Astana City Mayor Office as a Deputy Head of Digitalization Department. Uh, so I want to start with a little bit of background. Uh, our department was created in April 2020, just in the very beginning of the pandemic. So we initially was concentrated on the project related to pandemic, uh, specifically in the education and healthcare sectors. Uh, subsequently, we decided to take over all, all IT solutions from other department to align the databases with security, cybersecurity policies, uh, also to reduce the uh, maintenance cost and to build the unified architecture. And uh, one of these uh, IT solutions, what we've got, we've taken from other department, it was Astana City Master Plan. Uh, this uh, master plan used the uh, ArcGIS uh, license to visualize the city map. And uh, we decide to use this license everywhere where we need to use the map, to show map, data on map. Uh, sorry, how to, okay. And uh, we use it for, for example, uh, uh, we use uh, we integrated GPS uh, sensors from ambulance to the map to better manage the, them during the pandemic. Also, we uh, connect the special purpose vehicle of, of municipal services of uh, city administration to it to also better management to better coordination of them. Uh, also, uh, during pand pandemic, it was a big issue with the. Uh, a low internet speed because everyone was sitting at home and uh, it was a big pressure to internet and especially suffer our students who at that, at that time have uh, uh, have to study online. So we have uh, put to map all the complaints from citizens from which uh, uh, part of the city to see it, and also we conducted the the speed anal internet speed analysis on the city. Also, we integrate on the map, and together with the uh, cellular operators, we together uh, replace the base stations to increase the speed and add a, add additional base stations to cover all the parts of the city, so our students can freely uh, use the internet for learning purposes. So at the time, we don't know about uh, term of digital twin, and uh, we just uh, uh, use this uh, platform to visualize the data on the map. And uh, subsequently, we, when we finish all our pandemic-related projects, we uh, start to building our digital strategy of Astana City, also build the IT infrastructure, IT, IT in, uh, architecture of the city. And we decided to base, base our digital strategy on this uh, platform, on the master plan of the Astana City. Uh, so we consulted with the SRA company and they show us the capability of their platform. 
and partnered with the local representative of the S3 company and start implementing the functionality of the system. First of all, we start of creating 3D model of the of the city. We use drones to film whole city and uh, connect all footage from the drones to the coordinate on the map. So, so the resolution was around like uh, three centimeters per pixel. And uh, we also implement here around 800 different layers. It's include like a building passport, roads, trees, engineering network, road sites, etc. Everything. What we've got uh, city administration, we try to put on the, this map all data what can be shown shown on, on here. And uh, uh, one of the biggest, uh, how to say, best uh, representative of the how it can be used. So we uh, put on the map of all our engineering networks. We use special uh, detectors to scan the roads and put all all networks which was underground, not only underground, also on wires on this map and uh, it was around 40, in the beginning it just was around 40 different layers. So economic effect of these layers was around $1 million per year because uh, before it was a lot of time when someone doing trenching, they damage the engineering network and we need to repair it or dig in the completely different place because they don't know exactly where it located. Uh, so it's a really good solution which help us to use it properly. Uh, another another one we also cooperated with our energy provider in Astana. They use our platform to build their own digital twin. It was digital twin of energy system of Astana. They connect like of transformator substations all buildings and flats and monitor the data from each of them and it uh, during the 2020-2021 it was uh, popular to mine cryptocurrency using the video, uh, video cards and it's lead to the shortage of electricity in the city and several times we have some uh, uh, collapse of the uh, electricity in some districts of the city so they use this system to narrow the search arrays to allocate these uh, mining stations and uh, switch off them. Um, also, we put uh, all cameras to, to map. Also, we connect it via IPA. Uh, when they click to the camera, we can access to the uh, vi video stream and also access to the one month uh, video recording history. It's uh, we together with police department uh, rearrange the location of map of cameras because it was some situation where for one object was uh, under the surveillance of five cameras but in different angles. So we uh, put camera in different places to try to reach uh, to cover all blind spots and uh, we uh, uh, close around. 90% of the blind spots. We don't uh, reach the blanket video surveillance, but it was our goals, but we nearly completed. That just was need to um, in, uh, install some more cameras. And uh, it also significantly improves the hot pursuit uh, cases when police uh, use uh, these cameras to deal with crime. And uh, as I remember, we improved the hot pursuit cases from 55 to 75%. But it's not really accurate because, uh, because at the time during pandemic, the crime rate significantly dropped. Uh, also, we use uh, people registration, citizen registration data on map to see the population density on, density on map. And we together with uh, our urban department uh, review our master plan to add more schools and uh, more schools in kindergarten gardens to for people for more for for them. 
because we also have some shortage of schools at the time. Also, it uh, helped us to see the gap with the public transportation. So we uh, rearranged the schemes of public transport, also rearranged the scheme of the transportation itself. Some road was become one direct, only one direction. And uh, it uh, significantly improves the traffic situation on the road in the city. Uh, going to next. Also, also we put all medical organizations on the map, and to ensure uh, we recommend to open new clinics to ensure the walking accessibility for citizens where they don't have the hospital or medical organizations. And uh, RGS uh, also have the passport function, passport information function. So, so we as uh, city administrations put all data what we have about each object on the city it's a building here it's uh, service organizations repairman date etc to map and uh, it was like um, it was quite uh, uh, popular data so we sell them sell the data via via our subsidiary organizations to uh, other companies like uh, Google, Yandex, 2GIS. Okay, also we uh, mapped all trees on the map, on the, on the city to map. And uh, we use, with, together with the urban specialists, to get, we use the RGIS wind, wind generation function to, um, to modulate this wind condition in the city and we review the tree planting plan to reduce the wind corridor on the city. Also, we mapped uh, uh, data from meteor meteorological sensors from the city and also add to the plan, the tree plan in the tree planting plan, the mob trees is, it, uh, is a, in area with a high pollution rate to reduce the exhaust gases influence. And the last not least, uh, because we have everything uh, on the map, we also have the cemeteries. Not cemeteries, we have every grave on the map. And uh, we uh, use this information to automate the public service, which uh, give where citizens can choose bureau sites online, pay them, and order some additional services. Uh, it, it, this was just examples where we use it, but we have the, such layers everywhere in every sector of economy, like entrepreneurship, social work, education, healthcare, police, etc. And uh, in the beginning, not everyone understands the value of the digital twin. So, but after everyone start using it because uh, it has some situation when they need some data analysis, data and how to, you, with the time they understand how to use it. And for most of them, the, this has become the everyday use tool. So this is all for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Kevin, over to you. Thank you very much, Amazol, for, for this presentation. I mean, it's really fascinating what you can do uh, with data, and especially if you met them as nicely as, as Dana did. I think that's an important point also you're, to address what you mentioned, that it's important also to see the value. And very often, I mean, there's tons of data, but if it's not represented in a way that it makes it actually accessible for users, it's also very difficult to understand what, what the added value is. Um, I also like the fact that you use drones for mapping. That's something I think many cities are increasingly using um, to really gather um, the data also from, from above in a very, very often cost efficient way also and, and easy uh, to, to implement. I saw that there is a question directly addressed to you for your presentation. So maybe I'll, I'll just take that up quickly before we move into the panel. Um, it was uh, linked to, uh, you mentioned selling the data so it, the question is if you can elaborate a bit more what you mean about selling the data and what kind of data is interesting. Okay, we have data like uh, building the building data, building year, 
for example, uh, building repairment, the date, uh, building owner information, some uh, like this. And uh, we don't sell like sensitive data like uh, building plans, etc. Well, the data that can be you can be used for some for some crimes. We just sell the data that can be mapped to the in the map and can be interested for some for commercial commercial purposes. For example, building data it's uh, quite crucial information when when entrepreneurs make some decisions invest in this building or not. Also because we have the engineering network map, it also show which engineering network come to this building and how can they utilize it. For example, some old building even don't have some utilities and uh, they can just not buy this building, for example. And another map about, your, yes, we use open data. We actually use different maps uh, in the background. But core was uh, ArcGIS. Sometimes we use OpenStreetMark uh, map. Sometimes we use uh, Google Maps. Sometimes we use Yandex Maps because every every map have some some several uh, several advantages of them, and uh, each purposes have different map for each purpose. Well, thanks a lot. I think this this question of which data sources uh, will probably come up again in the panel. So I would like to invite. And thanks, Amazon, for addressing the question I just uh, um, mentioned. Um, I would invite the other speakers to the panel to be spotlighted. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you need to turn on your camera so that works. And I think it's also nicer if we have a conversation and we see each other. I'm saying that while, of course, facing today some technical difficulties, so sometimes my screen disappears. But I was told that you can still hear and see me. So if I'm looking into the void, it's probably because I actually... <laughs> cannot see my Zoom screen anymore. Um, I've Some of the questions have already, some questions have been asked in the chat and also have been addressed. So for those speakers who have already addressed them, thanks a lot. And it would be nice if you also can share and elaborate maybe a bit more uh, during, during this conversation. And of course, I invite all uh, participants online uh, to pose more questions into the chat if you're interested. Um, and I will kick off uh, with uh, the first question, which I would address to everyone um, on the panel. And it's um, it's about the successes of, okay, I, my Zoom disappeared. Oh, now it's back, sorry. Um, so it's, it's about the successes, like what the success factors for a twin transition or digital transformation. Like how do you see foresee the future development of trans twin transitions and smart cities, which often are linked. And what do you think, in order to be successful, what are the steps uh, cities should take in order to be prepared? And maybe I'll I'll address this to some representatives of, of, of the city. So maybe I'll start with Almaty. Andre, if you want to take that up, what, kind, what do you think are the key success factors and cities should take to prepare for? The microphone, please. I think Andre is muted. Great. Okay. Apologies. So I was saying that the key success factors for successful twin transitions in digital and environmental transformation include, in our view, robust infrastructure, stakeholder engagement, policy alignment, and innovation facilitation. As far as looking forward, the future of smart cities and twin transitions seems promising with increasing integration of technologies like AI, big data, analytics. Cities, in our view, should prepare by investing in digital literacy, creating adaptive uh, regulatory frameworks, and fostering partnerships between public, private, and academic sectors to leverage technological advances for sustainable urban development. I mean, thanks. I mean, maybe I just pass over to uh, to Raj to compliment. You mentioned you mentioned the importance of partnership, and I saw there was also a question in the chat, especially the partnership with with the private sector. So, um, and of course, policy infrastructure. I I liked Andre that you mentioned digital literacy. It brings it back to the people. So it's the people in the city who need to use it, but also 
uh, civil servants who are required to apply these these new and ever evolving um, technologies. So, Raj, what do you think are the the key successes? And especially, maybe you can elaborate on on the partnerships. Because I saw you responded in the chat, but maybe you can share it with everyone. Yes, thank you, and I'd certainly agree with what uh, Andre has said. Uh, around the, the engagement side, certainly the challenges around data. The bit that I would add in before I talk about the stakeholders is is the sort of use cases and the challenges that we're trying to address. Unless we have an objective and a purpose of what outcome we're trying to achieve and have a full understanding of that, the digital twin just becomes a, another digital tool that we're trying to find a solution for. So I think we should be challenge-led on all these approaches and making sure we're really clear about the objectives we're trying to achieve. And, and this is where that partnership really comes in because it is about city challenges. It's about bringing the right organizations together, understanding from different perspectives, that engagement piece that Andrea mentioned is absolutely important. Making sure that we understand the outcomes that different partners need to get, the value added that the digital twin will enable them to derive and what they can actually build on moving forward it cannot just be a static tool for a particular issue. It's got to have that capability to be evolving, changing, and addressing the challenges that are moving forward. Well, thanks a lot. I think this, you know, this agility piece, I think it's also very crucial, especially, um, I think it's both in terms of capacities and understanding, but I also think the policy part is very important, uh, increasingly important because the way we regulate technology and innovation, I think that is something which is becoming interesting for, from different perspectives. Um, also on the key success factors, um, Amanzol, do you have anything to add from your perspective to complement what Andre and Raj have, have said? In my perspective, it's important to prepare uh, like uh, people with the uh, right digital skills because when we use this ArcGIS platform, it was not a lot of people who can who know how to use this platform. And sometimes we even hire uh, specialists from abroad. Also important uh, data, like uh, right data management system, because uh, ev before it was like uh, every department used different data and it was not unified and have different like uh, structure. And we sometimes we completely rewrite it because to unify all data to the same standards. So that's all. Thanks, thanks a lot. I think very, very important, important factors. And I, I, I underlined the fact that you said it's like the digital skills to have them locally. I think that is also something which becomes a comparative advantage for, for many cities and municipalities if they're actually able to create that, uh, that knowledge uh, and keep it in, in, in their own, in their own cities. Um, uh, Zoya, you have anything you want you would like to add also in terms of maybe from a more theoretical perspective in terms of uh, key success factors. Sure. Um, yes, I would agree with um, uh, with my colleagues here, and I would like to go back to the Raj point about use cases. So I think uh, in a city, we can't really have one digital twin that serve all the purposes. So we need to have different use cases for different purposes, which means we will have different digital twin. So we may need to have a federated digital twin or connected digital twins. And then some of the key success factor that can sustain these, these kind of digital tool that we are providing is around how to make it extensible by uh, enabling it to, to incorporate more data in future, how it can be more scalable in terms of adding more devices, adding more sensors, actuators, or expanding the area that we are monitoring, and how to make these um, different uh, digital twin uh, interoperable, how they, they, uh, they would share data, how they would um, synchronize between each other. So, so these are the some of the factors that can help with the success of um, digital twin in long term. Thank, thank you very much for, for this addition. I think yeah, the scalability generally of, of, of these techni technical or digital solutions is something which I think we're all struggling with. And especially if you have a digital twin, having these flexibility is important. Uh, Grant, do you, did you want to add anything to this point? 
Thank you, Kevin. I guess just to uh, support a couple of views uh, that have already been said. So a success factor, I think, is just an improvement in data and the quality of data and access to data. I see that as being a, a very important step um, in terms of all the activity around digital twins. Um, and to Amazon's um, point in particular, actually, about uh, digital skills and skills within uh, the sort of local authorities, I think as well, is an important element. There is a role for the private sector, absolutely, to help to develop things through. But I think ultimately, um, having um, that knowledge transferred within um, and to local authorities to, to allow that sort of ability to update things uh, without having to to go external, I think is a, a really, really important element of it as well. So building that capacity um, is, is also a really important measure of success, I think, in terms of digital twins. No, th thanks a lot for that, Grant. I think the, the question of, maybe we stay a little bit with the question of, of capacity, but then also like ac accessibility. So, I mean, these are criteria which are important in order to make sure that these transformation or transition processes are just and inclusive. So how do you make sure that the if you use more and more technology and digitalization, that you don't forget to keep a people-centered approach and make sure that everyone benefits from it? I don't know, it's a question to everyone if um, who wants to speak first? Maybe Amanzol, because you mentioned really specifically the importance of digital skills. So how do you think you, you can we can make sure that that everyone is part of these uh, processes? Yeah, we face similar issue, but we do something. It was not useful for <laughs> anyone. Need to do, first of all, need assessment. If, you, if it's really need for people, some functions. Sometimes some people, they, they need, but because they don't know, the solution already exists. So needed, I think it's a need assessment, uh, maybe some um, uh, universal design, maybe that uh, everything was look similar because when we do, we try to make sure that was, because we use different platform and try to make sure that was uh, looks like similar everywhere. So that's all in my point. <laughs> No, thanks for that. I'm just, I'm laughing about that. That you said it looks similar. I was recently on a, in a discussion with 300 students on smart cities, and I asked like, what do you, what would you want to change if we talk about smart cities and digital transformation? And the main answer was, please stop creating new apps and just have one platform so it makes it easy for us. And I mean, these are students, so I think that's also something which, with increasing digital technology and as you mentioned, Zoya, like the scalability, like. That might not mean that we just create something in addition more and more, uh, but maybe to to harmonize it a little bit. Um, besides the need assessment, um, Raj, what do you think can make uh, our work really people centered uh, with regards to digital transformation and transition? Yeah, it is a really important part. I think that initial engagement with our citizens, making sure what they understand what we're trying to achieve and recognize the added value for them and making sure that what we develop is co-designed. So we are taking them along the journey with us, making sure they understand what the implications are and ensuring there are feedback loops to, under to ensure that we have responded to their needs and we are changing to actually reflect what they actually want out of the system. I think far too many times we have a concept of what a twin could be and we develop it from our technical or academic perspective without that engagement with citizens. And I think, and, th and, and that whole engagement piece, it's not just citizens, it's businesses as well. And the whole ecosystem has to be part of that design process built in right at the beginning. So it's an interactive, iterative process that enables that capability to, to be developed. I think that's a really, thanks for that. I think really important aspects on the on the code design. And you mentioned that sometimes it's too academic. So let's ask the academic, how can you make it more people-centered and actually easier to understand and to follow. Uh, Zoya, you want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah. So um, the, the, the 
the fact around co-design and having the stakeholders with us during the, 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 the design um, process is very interesting. And when we think about these systems, we should make sure that we are doing the just transition, right? We are not leaving behind any marginalized group or uh, any uh, people who are financially, let's say, struggling, etc. And from some academic uh, point of view, we may we we can think of building or developing some new and innovative business models, maybe, and see how would that work out for for different um, different group of people. For example, I can give an example of energy system and how you know, this innovative business model would help people. So for example, in energy system, we, we um, in order to have like uh, low carbon, um, zero emission um, technologies, we have a number of devices which are very expensive, such as heat pump, for example, or solar panels, right? And uh, one of the barriers from the people side to uptake these technologies is the upfront cost of the, these buying these devices. So one solution would be for the companies to, to provide these devices as a service to the people. So for example, having heat as a service where the company can provide heat pumps. Um, so the company is the owner of the heat pump. So the resident would not need to pay for, uh, for that, but it would pay only pay for the services they use. So, um, so my thinking would be if we can have some kind of innovative business models by delivering things as a service rather than the people don't need, so that the, the residents would not need to pay the upfront cost. That was something that can help with the people who are either financially struggling or some of the marginalized group. Well, thank you, thank you very much. I think I haven't heard about uh, sharing like the services, uh, the heat as a service, sharing the heat yeah. pump. That's, I think it's very interesting. Yeah, and we can have a heat pump uh, yeah. provided by the company or solar panels or, and the storage, et cetera. So th this this is some of the innovative business model that we are thinking about. That is a really, really great idea. Um, Andre, sorry, um, uh, I've seen you your hand okay. up, so please. I just wanted to add, I think, from our perspective and from our CT experience that we just make a deliberate effort making a point of not leaving anyone behind as far as providing digital services. For example, in our city development program, we have a specific objective uh, in the, as I mentioned, so one of the seven strategic directions is uh, smart city. Right? And so within that, we have two sub objectives, right? One is developing infra digital infrastructure but then another one is developing digital services. So, and under that objective, we have a vertical, whatever. So we have an objective of actually providing 100% of government services, local government services, city services, uh, making them digital by 2025, okay? And in 2023, we already had last year, we had 94% of our services provided in digital form, okay, digital format. So that's one. And then uh, as far as uh, multiple apps, indeed, so we are just starting our work to develop a super app for the city. You know, and so that hopefully will make it easier for you know, our citizens, our residents to navigate. No, that, thanks a lot for sharing that, Andre. I think one important word I also want to pick up from what he said is the deliberate effort. And I think everything like the twin transition, just transition, also digital transformation inclusion, it doesn't happen like that. You, we really need to be intentional and deliberate about our um, our work. I'm seeing the time is passing very fast and there are a couple of questions uh, which were asked in the chat. Um, I'm looking on that side because of, as I mentioned, technology <laughs> fails. So I have a second screen where my colleagues have gathered no, the questions the panel, so I can, easily, I, I can easily read them or call out the people uh, to unmute and actually ask the questions directly. And 
in the interest of time, please keep them short as possible. Um, so maybe I start with um, Elit Nisa. Um, you want to unmute your mic and ask your question? So I just saw in the chat that it's not working. So I'm gonna read the question. Um, so for addressing energy systems using the digital twin concept, what actions did you take across city segments to attain sensor-led data adoption? What recommendation would you make to better evaluate the behavioral data of building users inside the digital twin model? I, so I don't know if you have anyone specific you wanted to address this to, but I would open the floor if any one of the speakers want to, to react. Uh, so the recommendation how to make to better ev evaluate the behavioral data of building users inside the digital twin model. <laughs> Grant. I, I can certainly start uh, with this because it's, it's an area of ongoing um, other than my research group, we decided probably about a year ago that we would, as far as our research was concerned, and part of that is perhaps at the digital twin level, we would never get access to smart meter data, all the smart meter data, which I think is in part potentially what the question is regarding. A uh, very sort of high fidelity at a building level meter type of uh, data. And because we've taken that approach, what it means is we're never going to get that sort of gold standard of data. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't try and use it when it's available, but it just means that we have to accept that it's unlikely to be available over the time frames that we'll require to make differences in terms of a net zero approach. So, um, given that, what we can do is then a try and attempt to use synthetic data. So if we can bring other techniques to say, we don't know the exact, for example, half hourly electricity demand of that particular building, what we can do is say, this is our best estimate of what we think it is. And we can do that at an area-based approach as well. Having citizens share their data in the UK in particular uh, can be um, problematic. Um, and regardless if that is the case, it is unlikely that you would ever get within a particular area, which I guess digital twins have at their core. It's to do with a geographical area, technically. Um, then you'll never get 100% coverage of that anyway. So I think there, it's a great question. We, we struggle with this an awful lot. There's no easy answers here. So I'm just providing, I'm probably not giving you so much hope um, that there's an easy way around it. But I think there are other things. So uh, the Linux Foundation, for example, has started synthetic uh, data uh, as an element of it. It's called LF Open Synth. Um, so please have a look at that. And I think a lot of other people are starting to take a view that we're never going to get actual data, maybe at the levels that we require, and therefore we're going to have to synthesize that. But let's get better at syn synthesizing that data so we can use it in energy modeling, for example. I mean, great. Great. And thanks for taking a question, which is apparently very difficult to answer, and there's no full answer at at this at this uh, point, I I've seen there's a lot of questions. Um, some have already been addressed or a bit mentioned. Um, so I apologize to those which I will skip. I I hope <laughs> I hope it's okay in the interest of time. Um, so I just to acknowledge. I mean, if again I've seen you ask a few questions, some have been addressed. Um, so I'll just gonna provide the the floor to to some other colleagues who have asked questions. Um, uh, Via, do you want to unmute your mic and and ask your question? Otherwise, I will just uh, 
Okay, um, so in recent days, disaster event like fla flash floods, drainage blockages, bridge and dam collapse are very frequent in cities and they impact the city population. How can digitalization help to address uh, disaster events? Any one of the speakers who would like to take the question? So it's probably about, so Andre? Yeah. Well, uh, so I'll try to answer the question to my best ability. So Almaty is a highly seismic zone right, with frequent earthquakes. And unfortunately, in the last six to eight months, their intensity and frequency has increased. And that kind of brought the, uh, the priority of this work. Um, so what we're doing, so the a network of uh, seismic seismic stations, highly sensitive seismic, seismic stations has been placed all around the mountains. Well, at least for now, it's 28 stations. And, and they're now going, the software been installed, proper software, and now they're, you know, fine tuning it. Now, now these stations will be connected to a regional network, which goes to Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and so on. Okay. Now, this is one part. This is, I would call, an infrastructure. But now, again, this is this network and information is connected to our situational center. Right. And uh, so, whenever there is an earthquake, uh, so we get this information and this then is uh, displayed in the situation center. And then we also implemented another, a number of other services, which would uh, basically send a, a digital service, right? Which would send digital uh, notifications of the earthquake, hopefully up to 30 seconds, 20 to 30 seconds, because the wave of the earthquake is going through the region most often. And so we have this, you know, up to 20 second, seconds that we can give an advanced warning with the use of digital technology, okay? And then also, of course, thinking about our digital twin, we realized that one of the components is gonna be, has to be unfortunately uh, disaster modeling, modeling any, any damages that we would sustain in the city, you know, and, and how would that affect traffic and, and streets access and so on. So I hope I answer your question. Thanks a lot, Andre. I saw Raj, you have your hand up as well. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, I totally agree. I mean, we, we can never stop the, the disasters happening, but what we can do is be better prepared. And that this is the whole concept of instrument, instrumentating a, a city is really important through sensor technologies. And sensor technology is becoming cheaper and collecting that data through the right networks it is becoming a lot easier now as networks become more ubiquitous. So certainly things like drainage blockage and stuff like that. I mean, we often have, or cities often have scheduled plans for cleaning out their gutters. But if we had sensor technology in some of these areas to identify there is blockages there, so using other data to know there's going to be additional raining or flooding, we can go and address some of those to minimize the impact of what the um, disaster could be. So I think the whole objective, uh, the whole objective of uh, the digital twin gives us that capability using AI and predictive technologies to understand that potential solutions can be put in place to avoid some of the the, the impact of those disasters. So it means that instrumentation is really important and it should be built in to city developments as we move forward. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, Rod, for this additional uh, additional comments. I mean, very, very important. Um, I saw Amazol, you had your hand up and Zoe as well. In the interest of time, if you agree, I would ask one last uh, participant for asking his question. Um, and then I think we, we already have to, to wrap up, unfortunately. Um, Ilmi, you want to unmute yourself and, and ask, uh, and ask, uh, your question? Yes, Kirin. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion and excellent, uh, practices and thank you to, to the presenters. 
I'm interested in, in uh, learning a bit more about uh, your experiences with the digitalization of smaller cities and uh, municipalities. And specifically, can smaller cities in your countries or your experiences uh, adopt these digitalization experiences of uh, larger uh, cities in, in the in the country? And what are the professional and financial capacities of uh, smaller cities to implement these complex and larger uh, projects or initiatives? And if you have uh, specific experiences how you support smaller smaller municipalities to advance collectively and all the citizens from bigger municipalities or cities and smaller enjoy the same level of services uh, in, in one country. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ilmi. Who wants to take up the question? Also about learning and experience exchange from bigger to smaller cities and in terms of capacitating smaller cities uh, for successful digital transformation. Anyone? <laughs> Maybe I will try to answer some parts of the questions. In my yes, opinion, go ahead, the technical part of the digitalization is similar for a small and uh, big cities, but it depends from the volume of data. More data in the big cities and less data in the small cities. And uh, during the pandemic, we have several cases when we developed some solutions and uh, give it up it to the other cities like for free because we will need some urgent. Uh, solutions to deal with some emergency situations. So I can maybe will be good practices when someone uh, develops some solutions and share it with the smaller cities. It will be much better and save a lot of money. For example, one city develops something and share it with the other. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Amon, so for, for addressing Ilmi's question, as you mentioned, Partially, I think it was very well addressed. Is there any additional comments, last comments from maybe Andre or Raj uh, who work from bigger cities? Like how do you help smaller cities to also succeed in, in digital transformation? I mean, just, just, I mean, it is a difficult question. And, uh, and to some extent, I think smaller cities have an advantage over some of the larger cities because they can deliver end-to-end -end solutions and have bigger impacts than some of the larger cities. So when we do trials and applications, we only cover a very small part of the city, which then makes it really difficult to show how it can be scaled, how it can then be e extrapolated across other areas where a smaller, smaller city have that impact. What we've tried to do in, in the UK is have forums where we share what we are doing as different cities very open presentation to show what's been successful, what hasn't been successful, and then share the different organizations that have been working with us so that learning can be transferred across other organizations that probably didn't have the opportunity to have those trials. So it's not the answer you're looking for, I'm afraid, in, in terms of how easy it is, but the ability to share and openly share is one of the things key things what i've certainly seen over the years certainly in the smart city field is so often we share the things that are successful and, and we always talk about what we don't talk about is the things that have failed and the things that haven't gone well and one of the things that we really do try to we really do need to try to do more of is, is share our failures as well so that that's the lessons that smaller cities can learn because it's very expensive for a small city to make a big mistake Whereas for bigger cities, we can make those mistakes a little bit and absorb it. So I think that ability to learn from the mistakes is really important, as well as to talk about the successes. Thanks a lot, Raj, for that. And um, I think I think that's also a very good ending to end on the importance of sharing lessons learned, but also failure. And this is also what this webinar is about, to exchange experience, learn from others. Um, some questions have not been addressed. Alberto, Yifgen, I know uh, we can connect you to the speakers for follow up if you want. Apologies for that. Um, and with a very big thanks to Zoya, Grand, Raj, Andre, and Amanzol, I hand over to Darini uh, for some final words.
thank you very much. And also thanks to everyone who attended today's webinar. Well, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, just to say that you will very soon receive uh, the recording in Russian, Ukrainian and English, the presentations of the speakers were uh, uh, gracefully accepted to share their, their content and uh, summary of the events. We are all taking a break in August, but we will be back in September. So stay tuned, follow us on social media, and we will be looking forward to seeing you there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you all, to all speakers. It was fantastic to have you today. Bye, everyone. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. See you all in September. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.